ahead and make a beginning uh, with prayer. The Lord be with you. And with the high spirit. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we always give you thanks for all the wonderful things that you give to us, for all the blessings that you bestow upon us in this life. We ask that you would continue to bless us now as we consider uh, committing our lives in new and better ways, both to our spouses and marriage, to our work, to any of the commitments that we have in life, but most especially the commitment we have to you and to your church. We ask now that you would be with us, that you would bless us, so that your spirit would rest upon us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You would uh, space bar. Whenever I point at you like that, that kind of means you say space bar. <laughs> this means space bar. <laughs> Individual commitment to a group effort. That is what makes a team work, a company work, a society work, a civilization work. Said by the great football coach Vince Lombardi. And I chose that quote from Coach Lombardi because I wanted to start this morning by bragging a little bit. It's one of the great benefits of being the person who's in charge of what you get to say in terms of the sermon or during studies. We get to share personal stories or we can share jokes or we can share other people's stories and sometimes we just get to brag. So today I want to brag about my Saturday mornings and afternoons this month. And she's not here, she went to Kids Chapel, but I told her I'd be doing this today. After a couple of seasons of playing soccer at the YMCA, we decided to switch Avery over to playing Katie Youth Soccer. And between both the switch in the program and also in the age increasing, it's a world of difference between the two. See, back in the YMCA, and even in the first game of this year, it was like watching a bunch of ants that were chasing around a breadcrumb. If the ball went this way, then all 12 players, six on each side of the ball, would all just run to the ball. And everyone, except for the goalies, would frantically run around the field like crazy, and by the end of the game, they were all exhausted. And no matter how much we practiced or how much we yelled from the sidelines, it didn't matter. The ball is what the whole purpose of the game was. It moves, you chase it. But I think that we all know that's not how soccer or any team game works. And that's exactly what's finally kicking in. So the Red Hots, that's the name of their team this year, the Red Hots have focused our attention on stressing that each position has a role. Each position has an area of the field that needs to be covered. Each position has a place that it needs to be at certain times. Each position has a way it should approach other players in different situations. Not with the purpose of just chasing the ball, but so that when the ball comes their direction, they're prepared and there to help. Believe it or not, it's finally starting to take hold. At least I think it is. I mean, the ants still occasionally come out on the field. But from being on a team that lost most of its games last season, and having lost their first game this year, 3-1, to one, we have now won four games in a row, outscoring our opponents 13-1 to one in the last two games total. Yes. So I get to be a proud dad. I get to be a proud of sort of helping coach. I'm not an official coach. The two coaches are on the other side of the field. But trust me, I'm on the parents' side, and I help them with practice. And I'm the one yelling, running up and down the sideline frantically myself as, as they're going through the game. But obviously, I don't bring that up just to brag, but to bring our attention back to our current series, that of committed lives. Last week, we spent our time, and quite a bit of time, it won't be as long today, setting the stage and introducing the idea of what is commitment. And our whole study time was centered around three principles of commitment. Now, does anyone that was here last week want to take a stab at what those three principles were? Does anyone? 
A committed life sees purpose. A committed life requires action. And a committed life knows your impact. Committed life sees purpose. Committed life requires action. And a committed life knows your impact. And today we move from introducing those three principles to what I have called circles of commitment. Next week we're going to get into growing our commitment, then to empowering others, and finally we'll get into Commitment Sunday on week five on October 30th. And again, if you weren't here last Sunday, I just want to briefly tell you what we're going to be doing on Commitment Sunday. After going through looking at some of these teachings from one to four uh, each week, we're going to come to Commitment Sunday. And on Commitment Sunday, we're going to be communicating our vision for the parish. And we're going to put out some short-term, uh, excuse me, goals, uh, mid-term, long-term, two years, five years, ten years, perhaps even beyond that. And we're going to communicate what our specific focus is going to be during each one of those periods of time. Uh, we'll also be presenting what we're calling a narrative budget. And by that, we mean we're not going to just throw a bunch of numbers out to you in terms of what the church's budget is, but we're going to be putting that into uh, how your giving, your donations, and the budget of the church supports the purpose of the church. So, in other words, spending X amount on this particular reason, uh, this particular thing, and the reason for that, and why it's important. Um, and so that you'll get an overall picture of how the church, um, church's budget works, but also in terms of what it supports. And then we're going to have commitment cards. And on the commitment cards, we're going to have an opportunity for you to express, um, and they're going to be private, um, well, I don't know what they are, but uh, they're going to be private in terms of your personal commitments uh, that we're going to be uh, making. And then also we'll have on there a financial commitment um, that you can uh, provide to us as the best choice so that we can begin to plan for our budget in 2017. So that will be on October 30th. And we'll be handing those cards out uh, hopefully next Sunday so that you can begin to think about those things. Uh, we can explain them better and then we'll be able to return them on the 30th and we'll put them into the offering plate. But today, as you can see where I have the arrow, on well, week number two, we're going to be talking about circles of commitment. And if you've ever read the book or uh, heard of the person by the name of Rick Warren, you know, or the book of the Purpose Driven Church, um, or if you've ever looked up information on his church from Saddleback Church, then you may have heard of this idea before, or at least this term, because he introduces this idea of a thing called circles of commitment. And what he does is he defines certain levels of commitment within the church using concentric circles, the ones you see up on the screen. And he speaks of how an individual can be classified in terms of his or her involvement within the church and in their devotion as a Christian. You start at the outside, move your way inward until you reach what he calls the core. And if you look at the slide, you can see that he moves in the following way. The outermost ring is called community, and that's the unchurched. Then you have the crowd, which are the regular attendees. Then you have the congregation, which are the church members. Then the committed, which are maturing members. And then the core who become your lay ministers. From being a part of the community, or the unchurched, going through the rings, or the levels of commitment until you come to the core, the model represents one's growth and incorporation into the church and its ministry. And it follows a pattern of the Great Commission, of going out into the world and bringing them into the church, teaching and discipling them so that they can minister to others and repeat the whole cycle. Now, I bring this up to say this. This is not what I mean when I say circles of commitment. Let me show you what I do mean. I only bring that up because some people, I'm sure, have heard of that, and I don't want us to confuse what it is I'm talking about. We've all seen marriage represented by two circles. And I know we often talk about it being three circles with God, but for now, let's set aside God's circle. Each circle represents the individual as they come into marriage. And each circle comes with all that they have. They have 
their baggage, they have their values, they have their debt, they have their personalities. In my case, my wife came with a dead old cat that liked to be all over my clothes. <laughs> In her case, she got the best of everything because she got me. <laughs> Notice she's not in here with the eyes of me. <laughs> but once they're married, they are no longer two separate circles. Now they become two circles that overlap with one another. Yet at the same time, each one still maintains their individuality, yet each one is committed to the other. And the amount of overlap represents their commitment level one to the other. The commitment level is how much of yourself you put into the other circle. The further you overlap, the more you can say you are committed. And that overlapping area is the focus of what those commitment circles were that I showed you before. Now our focus today isn't about defining your commitment level. We'll touch on some of that next week when we look at things which strengthen and or prohibit your commitment levels. But today we have to start by defining what those circles are, as well as recognizing how those circles overlap. And the reason I told the story with Avery and her team and why I brought up Vince Lombardi's quote about the individual in the group is that as I watched the girls running around on the field, each moving in their own circle, if you will, each with their own purpose and their position, but each coming together and overlapping as a team, it was amazing what they were able to do. Actually, any sports team functioning together, or any team concept for that matter, whether sports or an orchestra, or marriage, or a workplace, or a society, or a civilization, to quote Lombardi, they all rely on the following. Like last week when we said that a committed life sees purpose, requires action, and knows your impact. Today we take those three principles and we be a little bit more specific. And we say a committed life defines their circles of commitment. A committed life defines their purpose for being in those circles or those commitments. And a committed life defines their impact in and from those circles. And what I did was provide you with a handout, a worksheet, if you will. And today will be a little different than me speaking the entire time. The page has a bunch of circles, if you look at the handout that we gave you, around a middle circle called me. And it looks somewhat like this. I did them in different programs, but uh, it should look somewhat like that. And all these circles are the circles of commitment. And I want you to take just a moment, and if you have a pen, wonderful. If you don't, then do it in your mind. You can do this later. But I want you to start filling out those circles. There's you in the middle, and then the circles all around are all, the are all of your commitments. And you can write a couple of them, and then finish them later if you want to. But while you do that, let me give you this thought. I put a bunch of circles on here. But ultimately, we can whittle these down to three. I'm going to call it the Trinity of how God created us. And I say it that way because the Trinity is sometimes represented this way. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, three persons, one God. Now, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, we discover that God created us in the same way. And I'm not talking about in terms of body and soul or body, soul, and spirit. I'm talking about in terms of our relationships and our commitments. Obviously, we have ourself. We can't get away from ourself. So that's circle one. And God created us to be in relationship with Him, which is circle number two. And finally, God created us to be in relationship with one another. He created Eve. He said it was not good for man to be alone. He said, be fruitful and multiply. And he also said, have dominion over all of creation. So ultimately, there are three circles, self, God, and community. 
And I bet that most of what you might be writing down are really smaller sets of that larger set on the right called community. But for our sakes, we're going to keep them apart for right now. And we're going to focus on all these little circles. So did anyone actually write anything down? OK, a couple of people. Do you want to share what you may have written down? No, you don't want to share? <laughs> OK, so I won't make you share that if you're uncomfortable with it. But I'll tell you some of the stuff that I wrote down. Okay, I have, and I can't see it all. I have Liz, my wife, Aiden and Avery, or my children. I put down church, work, friends, close friends, mentors, and my neighbors. And of course, at the top, we have God. Now let me ask this. Did anyone put down a task? You notice I did not put down any task. Did anyone label a circle with something like exercising? Or dieting? Or not smoking? Or tithing? Or cooking? Or anything like that? Let me say something about that for just a moment. Just in case that you're one of the ones that wrote it down. It's easy to say that we are committed to a task. I mean, I'm committed to my job. I'm committed to writing a sermon, or in this case, a study, every week. I'm committed to reading. But here's the thing. I am not committed to the tasks themselves. I'm committed to what the tasks accomplish. A committed life is not a commitment to tasks but a commitment to the purpose that the tasks help support and accomplish. I'm going to say that again. A committed life is not a commitment to tasks, but a commitment to the purpose that the tasks help support and accomplish. Purpose drives commitment. Tasks support commitment. For example, we do not commit to exercise. We exercise because we are committed to the purpose of bettering ourselves and or our health. We do not commit to tithing. We tithe because we are committed to God and giving financially helps strengthen our faith and our relationship with Him and furthers His ministry through a parish. We do not commit to doing date nights with our spouse once a month. We have date night once a month because we are committed to the purpose of strengthening marriage. Purpose drives commitment. Tasks support commitment. And I make that distinction because we often confuse the purpose and the tasks. And that can become quite problematic, especially when certain tasks don't work out or when certain tasks can't be accomplished. Like I said last week, actions without purpose is really just busyness. And when we focus just on tasks themselves, this is what we lead, a life of busyness. We rush to and fro, checking this off, checking that off, with a huge list of all that we did, and yet it never makes a difference in our life. And we don't often make much of an impact in any of the other circles that we wrote down. And then we scratch our heads and we get frustrated because we've worn ourselves out, we've spent all of our energy, and nothing seemed to happen. And I've learned, and I can testify to this personally, both in marriage and in parenting and in church, it's because the focus is on the tasks and not on the purpose. When you get your eyes fixed on the tasks, it's hard to see the purpose. And when you can't see the purpose, your life, well, it gets drained. But when you take the time to focus on the purpose, you start to prioritize things better. You start to recognize what is useful and what is not. You start to make choices that need to be made. You start to say the things that need to be said in the right way. You start to see some of what you thought was good might actually be something that's hurting. So you start to do away with a bunch of the busyness and you focus on effectiveness and you begin to live into your purpose. In other words, here's my favorite word, you empower yourself. So, having said all that, it leads us into the next part. And I'm not going to walk you through all of it. I'll leave you to think about that and meditate on your own. 
but I'll tell you what to look at, and then we're going to close. So Henry, if you would. Defining my purposes and impact. And this is where those overlaps start to happen. I didn't put the overlaps in here, but I did put some arrows there. And the arrows represent the movement of the circles towards or away from each other. As we move into another circle, and as another circle moves into ours, we have to recognize that they do overlap of both who we are, of what we want, and what our purpose is. So for each circle, for each arrow, we need to answer certain questions. And these are called our purpose arrows, if you will, our what and why arrows. And here's what we need to write for each of these the questions we need to answer. What do I want from committing to this circle, whichever one it is? What do we want from this circle? Because it's not only you, but it's you and whoever the commitment circle is. Or what do I or we need to do? How does who I am help or interfere with this commitment? If you truly want to make a commitment, you need to understand these things. And it may seem that this type of exercise is perhaps over the top or not worthwhile or perhaps not even church-like. I didn't mention much Bible today. But not having these questions answered can, have, and do cause a lot of problems in life. And no matter how well we have it all together, Reminding ourselves of these things helps us grow our commitments. And next week, we're going to get a little more skin in the game, so to speak. We're going to be looking at growing our commitments, drawing attention to the things that we can do to strengthen our commitments and those things which will help or those things that can actually weaken our commitments. But for today, I would ask that you think on these things this week. Take your circles. Work them out with some heartfelt and time dedicated thought. And in particular, especially since we're coming up on Commitment Sunday at the end of the month, take some time to focus on the circle of your relationship with God and with this parish of St. Matthias. What do you want from this parish? What do you think this parish wants from you? What do you offer? To this parish? <coughs> how do you help? Or perhaps even how do you hurt? What does this parish offer you? How does it help your life? Why are you here today? What makes you commit your time or your treasure or your talent? But most importantly, what makes you devote your heart to this parish? Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you for this time that we've had to consider these things. We ask that you would write them on our hearts, on our minds, that we may think on them throughout this week, and that we may continue to try and to develop more committed lives to you, to this parish, and to all those around us. We ask now that you would dismiss us with your blessing and that you would bless the food that we're about to receive next door in Johnson Hall. And now the peace of God which passeth all understanding your hearts and minds, the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you all.